Speaker, I personally believe we should all be scientists, but you don't have to take my word for it. Instead, you can take the word of Tammy Reese. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Who's had a decent lunch today? Where did you go? Home. All right. That's awesome. I went to Sugarfish a few blocks away. I'm visiting from New York, and I used to be in Los Angeles, so the fact that there was a Sugarfish two blocks away made you say I had to go. So good afternoon, I'm Tammy Reese, and today we're gonna learn about one of my favorite topics, which is why I think everyone should be a scientist. Uh, this fits a lot into what Sonia was just talking about, about UXing your life. So if you don't mind, close your eyes and imagine a world where mistakes are welcome, where people collaborate and share and are transparent with what they've learned to not only help themselves excel, but to really allow the rest of the community to also excel. That we can learn from each other, both our successes and our failures, so that together we can build a better world. Great, open your eyes again. So from my perspective, that world only exists if we all become scientists. And you may be wondering why I think there's such a strong correlation there, but that really dives into what I think a scientist is. So basic definition of a scientist is someone who practices the scientific method. So if you are like me and you hate when the definition includes the word from before, uh, let's look at the right. Uh, and the right talks about how the scientific method means that you have an observation, you formulate a hypothesis, you create an experiment and then you either make another hypothesis or you go into more experiments in theory depending on what it is you learned in that experiment. So scientists practice the scientific method. And this is the scientific method. We observe, we hypothesize, and then we test. And if this slide looks a little similar to other things, it's because it's actually the build, measure, learn graphic from the Lean Startup. And from my perspective, the adoption of the Lean Startup is really, really wonderful in the sense that it's encouraging people to experiment more. So build, measure, learn is really just saying, run an experiment. But from my perspective, it's not just a matter of the MVP of scientific experimentation because the Lean Startup very often just ends there. You build an MVP and you learn from that, but then you feel like you have all the answers and you forget to keep on experimenting. And what Sonia was talking about is really about how do you continue to make those data-driven decisions. So how do you take this build, measure, learn experimentation idea into everything in your life? So let's talk about the behaviors of a scientist. Oh, sorry, we're gonna talk about the benefits of scientists. I change around things. So wh why do I care about this? From my perspective, the nature of experimentation and being scientific, the value is that it minimizes risk. You're doing something small and you're minimizing your investment. And what you're doing is you're allowing yourself to not overly invest until you have a positive direction. You have positive indicators that say, yes, I should go in this direction and I should continue in this direction. Which in the end maximizes the probability of success. So minimize risk, minimize investment, maximize the probability of success. That sounds awesome, doesn't it? Wouldn't we all love to be successful and not be putting our energies and investments in the wrong direction? So this is where being a scientist plays in. The other part of it is for everyone. So how can we increase the probability of success, not just for ourselves, but for everyone? How do we share? How do we collaborate? How do we tell others what we've learned in a way that allows for them to learn as well? So that they don't put the wrong investment in the wrong place, and they don't exude their time and their money and their energy and their efforts for something you've already found out either works or doesn't work, and you can either speed them along their path or help them from going in the wrong direction. So, oh, I'm normally on the other side. So pretend that arrow slides this way. <laughs> I'm a scientist. Uh, these are a whole bunch of logos that correlate with my life, um, and it made me laugh because I put this together just for today because so many of them are LA logos. I lived here for 13 years. I was one of the first product managers at Cornerstone On Demand. I worked for Science, the incubator, uh, under Mike Jones. Um, and nowadays, I, I run a company called Cyrus Innovation, 
and we launched an app called Just Not Sorry, which is how I got invited here today. And we'll get into what that does in just a second. But I believe in experimentation. I have a bachelor's of science degree from UCLA and a master's of science from University of Florida. And what I want to teach you is how to be a scientist too. So here is your easy step guide to being a scientist. Step one, be visionary. Challenge the status quo. Say, what I'm currently looking at is not okay. I have a vision where this can be better. There's a problem in the world, and I'd like to solve it. I see that by solving this problem, things can get better. I have a vision, world can be better, right? That's the first thing. But make sure it's a real problem. This is a personal pet peeve of mine. Stop solving problems that don't exist or only exist for you. Make sure there's a market for them. Make sure it's a real problem. So this is Jane Goodall. She's one of our first scientists that we're going to see today. We're going to see a bunch of scientists. And she says, what you do makes a difference. And you have to decide what kind of difference you make. So you have the option of running experiments and making a difference by solving a real problem. And that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Next step. You think that the world can be better and you have a solution. That's great. Have confidence. We call that hubris. Balance that with humility. Understand you're probably wrong. Most of us are probably wrong all of the time. We're back to some eighth grade science here. This is H naught and H A, the alternative hypothesis. When you do any sort of experiment as a scientist, you always say, this is what I think is going to happen, and here's how I might know I'm wrong. Right? From the get-go, you say, I'm probably wrong. That's the scientific method. Do that. No, you're probably wrong. And accept that from the get-go. Because that's how we learn. We admit that we're going to be humble. This is the humility and hubris balancing act. But don't get so humble that you don't even try it. Bring in the hubris. Say, I can do it. Just because this problem hasn't been solved doesn't mean that I'm not the person to solve it. And I'm not the person to get other people together to solve it. Because we need people who are those visionaries who believe that they can solve problems. Otherwise, the problems stay, right? So I think the people who are trying to make things better, they're called scientists. And whether that's a lack of knowledge around a situation or an actual physical problem that's out there in the world, that's what I think we can do. So this is Thomas Edison. Uh, and he said, I have not failed in building a light bulb. Um, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work in making a light bulb, right? He accepted that he was going to be wrong a lot of the time. And eventually, he created the light bulb. And isn't that wonderful, right? He said, look, all of us live in dark areas, and there's kerosene lamps, and they're burning down homes, and that's not safe. What can we do to make this better? He was solving a real problem, and he kept trying. He kept trying and trying and trying until he got it right. So how did he know he got it right? He designed an experiment or a test, and he measured. He said, these are the metrics that I know I'll be right, and here are the metrics that I know I'll be wrong. And he took a data-driven direction, data-driven decisions. Look at numbers. What a foreign idea to some of us. But really, there's so much data there that can help us direct us towards the end, towards the right direction, especially if we can accept that maybe our initial direction was wrong. So this is my iHeart data slide. Um, this is trusting the user, trusting the data, and trusting the hunch. Because I don't want you to think that I say you should only make a data-driven decision. Use your gut. Our guts are smart, our guts are real, and our guts can teach us a lot. But use that as the initial direction. Have an inkling, have a hunch, have a gut feeling that you might be right, and then go out there and test it. And then look at the data to either confirm or deny whether or not you were headed in the right direction. There is nothing wrong with trusting your gut. Many great decisions start with trusting your gut. But when the data says your gut was wrong, accept that. Take a bit of humility and say, that's OK. And embrace it and say, I'm human and I'm real. And I'm just like everyone else that a lot of the time I'm wrong. But the difference between me and someone else is that I'm going to learn from that. I'm going to be a scientist. And I might just tell someone else about it. So Albert Einstein here says, a person who never mistake never tried anything new. It's, it's, a, it's a reality, right? 
If you've never made a mistake, it means you've never tried anything new. Go out there, make mistakes, learn from them, try new things. Because unless you try new things, the problems of the world don't get solved, right? If we had all of the answers, the problem wouldn't be there. We have to think about new, innovative solutions to try to make things better. So, and once you do that, collaborate and share. This is, if I, you can take one thing away from today's talk with me, it's collaborate and share. Be transparent. This is an awesome uh, slide. If anyone was here for Audrey's thing this morning, um, so here's a scientist and he has a great idea what no one has done before. And he spends a lot of time and resources and he thought it could work. And then far, far away in another lab, the exact same thing is going on. And we as a community are wasting time and resources and really smart people because instead of building on each other's knowledge in both success and failure, we aren't collaborating enough. So be transparent. Tell other people. So here's a, some examples of some scientists I like. Uh, this is our example of Just Not Sorry. It's an app that underlines when you use undermining words. I can talk about that at length some other time. But we went global, and one of the things we did is we open sourced it. We said we can't solve all of the world's problems when it comes to email communication. We have a few words we highlight. If other people want to do something similar, do it. We've, we've, we've unlocked the key for you. Just make it easy afterwards. So here are some other scientists. Walt Disney. I went for some local scientists in today's slides. So Walt Disney Epcot, Epcot stands for the Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. His vision was that we would all live in an area and we'd be able to try out new things and the biggest brands of the world would be sharing their ideas with real users, looking at real users to, talk, to touch things and get feedback. This is Mark Zuckerberg, move fast and break things. He's encouraging his team to make mistakes. Elon Musk. So uh, Chris was talking about Elon earlier. What I want to talk about with Elon Musk is he said, I want to change the world. I want people to be driving electric cars. I want people to be getting high speed different places. But what did he do that was so against his shareholders? He open sourced the technology. He said, in order for this to actually be a real change, I need to put it out there in the hands of other people, right? I need to open source this technology because otherwise it's just me and my investors making the change. So think about how much that, of a shift that is. I have all of this immense intellectual property that's worth millions and millions of dollars, but I'm giving it away. Because the answer is I can only change the world and we can only change the world when we work together. This is predictable revenue and it talks about the repeatable process. The nature of the scientific method and sharing gets us to repeatable processes. This is a woman who runs a dormy, and it's a lingerie company, and she's going around talking about the data she learned, about the photos they have on their site, and it's called Blondes Have More Fun, But Brunettes Sell More Lingerie. Because <laughs> brunettes sell more lingerie, according to her data. You know what that happened? She also found out that plus-size models sell more lingerie. So now there's a plus-size model in Sports Illustrated. So think about the impacts we can have on young girls. This is a President Obama, and what's he talking about? He's talking about how cities and states and municipalities can be experimental labs for things like free community college so that we can then say, let's work out the kinks on a small scale, let's minimize that risk and the investment so that later when we bring it to the large scale, we can maximize the probability of success for everyone. This is Chris Rock, he likes to practice a lot before he gets up on stage. That nature of iteration and timing and practice. So how can you be a scientist? Because that's the whole point of my speech, right? I want you to get out there and be a scientist. Experiment, experiment with everything. Sonia just talked about experimenting with her online dating profile. Do that, you'd be surprised what you can learn. This is a map of Los Angeles traffic. Waze is a way of sharing when you see an accident. Be communal, right? T try a new route, see if it works. And rather than saying it's your new secret route to get down La Cienega to LAX, share it with some other people so that they can get to LAX faster too. Uh, we AV test our HR recruiting profiles online. And then we have data about how they're doing. Everything can be tested if you want to. This is a data-driven integrated digital marketing team in the UK. They have this on a wall. They care about data. They're saying, we have hunches and we're gonna put out experiments, but then we're gonna let the data decide. This is my family. 
Um, these are our two future scientists, my twin nieces. They say things like, hey, mom, if you say raspberry sherbet is made with raspberries, what happens if we freeze raspberries? Maybe it'll taste like raspberry sherbet. And my sister, who runs a lab at Hunter High, says, great, let's run an experiment. And they say, great, we have a hypothesis, and we're going to test it. So how can we encourage the next generation to think that as well, that these are experiments? Because even though they're wrong, right? Because sherbet really has sugar and water and other things, they learn something. And that's the opportunity to learn by making mistakes. How can we create environments where mistakes are acceptable? These are the steps again. These are the benefits. It's all about minimizing risk. It's all about minimizing investment with the end game of maximizing the probability of success for everyone. So my final slide is, life is an experiment. The more experiments you make, the better. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Be a scientist. Go out there, run an experiment. You never know what you're going to learn. Thank you.